Welcome to this session. Uh, this is a, uh, an online information session for all our stakeholders around the region um, who we unfortunately can't meet in person here in, in Suva, Fiji. Um, we'll be doing one more tomorrow afternoon, so as we go along, if those of you who need to leave um, or would prefer to listen in tomorrow, you're welcome to join us then. Just send me an email and I'll, I'll forward you those details. Okay, um, I'll just very, very briefly speak about the Biopharma program overall, and then we'll, we'll get straight into the action component. Um, so, so this is an initiative of the African, Caribbean and Pacific group of states. Uh, it's financed by the European Union, uh, the 60 million euro investment. Uh, and the claim of the project is um, the Biodiversity and Protected Areas Management Program. Uh, we're in the second phase of this program, uh, which runs until 2023. So it's, uh, it's a global program. It's not just uh, operating in the Pacific region. Uh, it's also being implemented in the Caribbean, um, Central and Western Africa, Eastern and Southern Africa, and, and here in the Pacific. So it actually covers 79 developing countries. Here in the Pacific region, um, implementation is led by the Oceania Regional Office of IUCN uh, in partnership with the European Commission Joint Research Centre and SPREP. Um, many of you will know SPREP, the Secretariat of the Pacific Regional Environment Program. So in, in the Pacific, we're focusing on the, uh, the 15 independent states, so uh, that includes Timor-Leste. Uh, and just down uh, the images on the bottom left of that screen, uh, on the left there is Paul Van Nimwigen. Uh, many of you will probably know him by now. He's the Protected Areas uh, Coordinator, and he's overseeing the um, implementation of the whole Biopharma project. Then there's uh, me in the middle there, focusing on the action components, so the grant facility. And on the right is Ananta Singh. She's uh, assists with our finances. Okay, so um, in, in uh, the Pacific region, we're focusing on four particular areas. Um, today's discussion is, is solely focused on the action component, uh, the, the grants, um, but just so, so you're aware, there's, there's three other kind of uh, parts of the program. One is to uh, develop a, a resource and data hub uh, and that will be hosted by SPREP. Uh, another is uh, developing learning sites that demonstrate how protected area management in the region can be enhanced uh, through practices and tools. Uh, and we're also uh, preparing some state of protected areas reports, uh, which will be the kind of the first comprehensive review and analysis of the status of issues of protected areas, um, status and issues, sorry, of protected areas in the region. Okay, so um, this is a, the list of all the things I'm going to cover in this session. There's quite a lot to get through, um, so I'll uh, please let me know if I'm speaking too fast. Um, but uh, yes, the European Union has a lot of rules and requirements. Um, some of you will be familiar with uh, working within EU grant guidelines. Some of you may not, um, but we'll hopefully get all th through all this this morning. Um, just a, a bit more context so you know, the, um, the action component has been designed by the IUCN headquarters uh, in close collaboration with the donor, with the EU. So it's, it's actually being managed um, centrally and our role here in the Pacific is, is more of a supporting role. Um, so we're here to help, help our stakeholders access that funding and support them throughout project implementation as much as possible. It's also um, probably important to say here that uh, Paul and I won't be making the decisions about who gets the funding. That, that will be made centrally, and I'll, I'll talk more about that later. So this will probably take about maybe 30 to 40 minutes, depending on how many questions there are. Um, and then at the end, uh, if for those of, those of you who are interested in, in sticking around, I can just quickly show you the, the portal, um, which I'll talk more about throughout the presentation. So I'll cover the objectives of the action component, um, who can apply, 
uh, location and activity requirements, eligible and ineligible activities and costs, uh, and then the submission and assessment process. Just so you're aware, um, all of the information that I'll be telling you is, is contained uh, in these documents that I'll describe in a minute. Um, and, and I think I said all the, earlier, we'll, we're happy to send around a recording of this presentation and, and the, the actual slides as well. So the image at the top left here is a snapshot of the Biopharma Action Component Portal. So this is the, I think I've sent the link around a couple of times, this is the website um, that you you need to lodge your application um, from, and it has all the relevant material that you'll need to um, yeah, uh, meet all the eligibility and um, evidence requirements. Down on the bottom left here is a, a picture of the grant guidelines, which I've also attached to the calendar invitation, and the ESMS manual for applicants. So that's the, I guess, the settings around the environmental and social safeguard requirements of IUCN. So, if you can't find the answer to your question in these three documents, um, over on the right here is an image of the operational manual. This is 130 pages, but um, it's essentially the real nuts and bolts of the grant program. So that's another resource that is available to you um, through the Action Component Portal, but obviously you can, um, you can just contact us at any time if you have further questions or would like to discuss project ideas. Okay, uh, this is the main objective of the action component, to improve biodiversity conservation in priority areas uh, through funding tangible on-ground actions that address management and governance priority actions identified by diagnostic tools. So there's quite a bit of um, program-specific terminology in this objective, which, which I'll unpack a little later, terms like priority areas, priority actions and diagnostic tools, um, but that's just to give you a sense of the overall goal of the grants. That overall goal is supported by three specific objectives, and your proposal uh, must align with at least one of these objectives. So the first is uh, enhancing the management and governance of priority areas. The second relates to strengthening the legal framework. And the third is about enhancing livelihoods of people who live in and around uh, protected areas. Okay, the funding envelope. So we have 21 million euros available for the action component across all regions over the life of the Biopharma program. So that's up to 2023. Uh, so that 21 million is um, will be divided across the six regions. So for the purpose of the grant, they've separated the African regions a little further. So you can see there we have an indicative budget of 3 million euros for the Pacific region. There's also at the bottom there um, 3 million euros that's been set aside for full competition between the regions. So, so well, obviously all the grant money will be awarded through a competitive process, but there's a, an extra extra bucket of money down the bottom there um, that we might be able to access. So uh, there are multiple grant types. Today we're focusing on the medium grants because that, that at the moment that is the only one that has launched. So uh, in future there will be calls for uh, proposals for the smaller grant types, but at this stage uh, we're just calling for proposals for the medium grant size. It's likely that there'll just be one medium grant call for proposals, given the length of the, the project. So you can see there that the smaller size grants, the SWIFT and technical grants, are for up to 50,000 euros, and they, they're shorter term projects, um, 12 months, and just targeting uh, local level activities. The small grant category is from between 50 and 100,000 euros, and, and those projects can last for up to two years, and they can be targeting local or national scale. And then we have the medium grants, um, the focus of today's session, where projects can run for up to three years and can, can also be at the regional level. So of that 21 million euros, 
my audio is being restored. Of, of that 21 million euros for the entire action component, uh, Just testing, can everybody hear me? I just had a, my connection drop out briefly, I think. Yes, uh, yes, I can hear you again. Yes. Thank you very much. <laughs> Great. Okay, um, so for this medium grant round, we have uh, 7.2 million um, set aside uh, to cover all regions. So we are hoping to, hoping to get about three, perhaps four of this large or medium-sized grants uh, coming to the Pacific region. Uh, and, and given that, um, we're encouraging uh, organisations to work together as much as possible to submit uh, partnership applications. So just a little snapshot, a few more details. As, as we already know, grants can can range from 100 to 400,000, and the minimum length is 12 months. But they they must end projects must end by the 1st of December 2022. Uh, the application process is single stage, so rather than submit a concept note and then full proposal on the by the deadline of the 21st of September, applicants must submit their full proposal. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, the application is through the portal, so it's an online application form. Um, and yep, deadline 21st of September. This is a snapshot of the portal and there's the address down there. And as I mentioned earlier, I'm happy to just quickly show you how to log in and navigate the platform if, you, if you'd like. It's quite straightforward, but um, we, can, we can get to that um, towards the end of the session. Okay, so this is a, an overview of eligibility. Uh, I just say up front before we get into this, um, we've, we've already had a few, a few questions about this. Obviously, organisations are formed in all sorts of different ways. Um, so it's possible that after this explanation, you might still feel like your, your organisation is in a bit of a grey area. Um, if that's the case, perhaps well, we can, I can try and answer the question now, but if not, um, feel free to email me afterwards and we can um, seek clarification about um, eligibility. So, um, applicants must be a registered public entity, non-profit entity, or small or medium enterprise. So essentially, you, you can't be an individual or sole trader. Um, you must be one of these types of, sorry, just over here, one of these types of uh, entities. So a, a government entity, a protected or conserved area, an NGO, a community-based organisation, or a regional or international organisation carrying out field projects. Applicants must be established in one of these four, um, meaning one of these four categories, so either established in an African, Caribbean or Pacific country, an EU member state country, a European overseas country and territory, um, or an OECD member state. And applicants must be directly responsible for uh, preparing and managing the project, so you, you can't act as an intermediary. Um, so the organisations implementing the Biopharma program, which is essentially, for, for our purposes here, IUCN, uh, the, joint, the European Commission Joint Research Centre and SPRET, are not eligible to apply for funding, nor are uh, staff or family members affiliated with those organisations. IUCN member organisations are eligible to apply. Um, so you, that's fine, you just need to demonstrate that you're um, legally and structurally independent from the IUCN Secretariat. Okay, so the terminology they're using in this grant program is lead applicant and co-applicant. Partnerships um, between large and small organisations or government and non-government organisations are encouraged, but not mandatory. So the lead applicant uh, will be the main contact point for us and, um, and headquarters, and the lead applicant bears responsibility for implementation. 
implementation. The co-applicants who, who might be delivering particular components of the project must meet the same eligibility criteria, but they play a supporting role, um, supporting the lead applicant. And just a note on the number of proposals you can submit. Um, per region, you're, an organisation can submit um, a maximum of two proposals. If you submit a proposal um, as lead applicant for both of them, it'll only be possible to, to be awarded one, one grant as the lead applicant. But you may be awarded um, a second grant as a co-applicant, as long as you can, you can demonstrate or your organisation can demonstrate that you have um, the sufficient operational and financial capacity to successfully implement both projects. I might just pause there and see if there are any questions so far. We're about to get into a bit more detail about uh, lead and co-applicants and a bit more detail about particular organisations, but are there any questions uh, at the moment? I have a, a, just a small clarification question. Yes. Um, you mentioned that an organisation can submit a maximum of two proposals per call per region. Do you yes. consider ACP to be one region? Uh, that would be no. So, the, so for the Pacific region, you could submit two. Um, in the African regions, your organisation could also submit two. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah. Okay. So, um, this this series of slides just relates to. Uh, a few extra conditions on who can apply as lead and who can apply as co-applicant. Um, so we'll start at the, at the local level. So for this, basically the smaller organisations, so local uh, civil society organisations or NGOs, local non-for-profits, community-based organisations, uh, small, small businesses that um, help manage protected areas or local government, uh, these groups can only apply as a co-applicant. So they, they can't apply as lead. They must partner with other organisations at the national, regional or international level. But they're still eligible, eligible to apply, just not as a lead applicant. For um, protected or conserved areas, uh, or Indigenous and community conserved areas, for example, these groups may apply as a lead applicant, but they must be in a partnership. So there, there must be co-applicants involved in, in project implementation. At the national level, uh, there's no restrictions on, on whether you apply as co or lead, and that covers uh, national regional protected area networks, national NGOs and national government. So for our EU member state organisations, for example, organisations based in Germany or France, uh, the OCT orgs, for instance, uh, French Polynesia or New Caledonia, and for our regional and international organisations, um, these groups may apply as the lead or the co-applicant, uh, but there's a, a few other uh, criteria attached um, for these groups uh, that essentially relate to, to partnerships um, and engagement with relevant stakeholders. So, we'll need to see that the pro proposal has been co-designed with and agreed by the relevant um, partners. So for instance, the relevant government authority, the relevant local communities or, or local, um, local civil society groups. Um, we'll need to see a formal letter of support um, from the relevant national government agencies or protected area authorities. Uh, and that has to be a, a formal letter, not an email. Um, and and the applicant will need to demonstrate it has experience cooperating on protected areas and natural resource management, uh, conducting e uh, field actions, and experience collaborating with these partners. For the, the project itself, uh, there's similar requirements. So uh, we need to see that the project is based on partnerships and, and consortiums uh, with the relevant stakeholders I mentioned earlier. Uh, that it's based on an equitable di division of work and collaboration with these groups. 
that there are clear priorities related to capacity building, improving protected area management and governance effectiveness, um, and, or natural resources management, and that the appropriate level of consultation has been done or will be done as part of the project implementation. For our OECD member state organisations, so those based in, for instance, um, the US, Australia or New Zealand, uh, there's just one, one extra layer for you guys, um, and that's that project activities must occur in, in at least one of the least developed countries. So in the Pacific region, they are Kiribati, Solomon Islands, Timor-Leste, Tuvalu and Vanuatu. So if, for example, it was a regional project and was uh, had activities in multiple countries, activities would need to occur in at least one of these five countries. Um, page four of the guidelines has a footnote that has a little bit more detail about that, but that's essentially what, uh, what it's saying. So yes, uh, as I mentioned earlier, there, there may be a little bit of a grey area for your organisation, so feel free to get in touch if you'd like to just clarify the organisation stuff that we're eligible to apply. Okay, geographic criteria. So project activities need to occur in, in one of these 15 countries. And activities must take place within priority areas in wider conservation seascapes and landscapes. So I guess this is the part where we define, define our terms a little. Um, the priority areas is a very broad term. So it obviously can include protected and conserved areas, but it could also include other important areas like key biodiversity areas or marine managed areas. In the uh, online application form, there's a section where you'll need to describe the priority area or areas uh, where your activities will take place um, and justify its significance. So you, that's where you would say it's an existing KBA, it's a proposed protected area, uh, it's, a, it's a conserved area under particular legislation. So it's definitely not the, the um, IUCN protected area categories, it's a much broader um, scope than that. So just some, um, some more activity criteria. As I mentioned at the beginning, the, the project needs to be consistent with one, of, one or more of the objectives of the grant, and they relate to the management and governance, legal framework and livelihoods objectives. They need to address clear priorities for action, uh, which I'll come back to shortly. Uh, they need to comply with our environmental and social safeguard uh, rules, which I'll also touch on soon. Uh, and, and they'll need to be expressed through a, a project uh, logical framework. So uh, in, in the application form is um, a section where you enter your log frame details. So that's um, you know, your, the results, so the tangible results that the project will deliver, your activities that you'll um, implement to reach achieve those results, the indicators you'll use to measure your success. Um, so for guidance on that, there's a link embedded in the form which takes you to log frame guidance developed by the European Union. Um, but we're also happy to help you if, if you'd like, if you'd like to um, develop a, a sound, strong logical framework. Uh, and like most projects, uh, any data that's generated by your projects uh, will need to be shared with, um, with Biopharma. Okay, priorities for action. So funding will support priorities for action um, in protected or conserved areas. Uh, these priorities can be articulated at various levels. They can be regional, national or site level priorities, um, but they need to be um, publicly available and, and identified through credible sources. Uh, each proposal can refer to up to two priorities. So this is... Um, a table with some examples of, of sources of these priorities. The program refers to kind of three categories. Uh, the first they, they call diagnostic tools. 
So these are essentially um, tools that we would use at the site level to determine site level priorities. So the main ones are, are, are met, met or, sorry, PAME assessments, so protected area management effectiveness assessments that have been conducted at the site level that generate recommendations or priorities for action is the preferred source. Uh, and the reason we say that is because um, projects that can align with priorities identified through these tools are eligible for five extra points out of 100. That said, um, if the area you're interested in working in has not had any kind of site level assessment done, that's fine. Um, as long as it, as it aligns with a priority identified elsewhere, uh, that's it's still eligible for funding. So the other two options there are strategic documents. So for instance, uh, every country has a national biodiversity and strate strategy and action plan, or protected area policies, protected area management plans, um, these kind of documents, or, or published studies that have been validated by the relevant protected area management authorities. So journal articles or project reports, as long as they're publicly available. So each of the regions has done desktop research to try and um, pull together the known priorities for protected areas um, to assist applicants. So on that, uh, on the action component portal, if you scroll down on the main page, you'll come to a section down a section there called priorities for actions. And you can see each of the regions there on the map. And if you click on the Pacific option, it will take you to an Excel spreadsheet that looks like this. So essentially, uh, this this is the a, a guiding document. It's not an exhaustive list. It's a list of priorities that we were able to find um, that you may wish to align your projects to. So the first tab uh, sets out regional level priorities, and these have been taken from the framework for nature conservation and protected areas in the Pacific Island region uh, from 2014 to 2020. Then you can see across the bottom here, there's a tab for each, each of our 15 countries. So to give you an example from Palau, you can see uh, the national level priorities are up the top here. And they've been taken from the NVSA from this uh, 2015 to 2025. Uh, and in 2014, Palau did a nationwide uh, assessment of its protected area network, of the, uh, the management effectiveness of it, and produced a report, this one on the right here, which is full of site level recommendations, um, which we're taking as priorities for action. So for Palau, uh, there's national level priorities, um, but there are also site level priorities. Uh, and then if you scroll a little bit further down the spreadsheet, there's a list of useful resources, so all sorts of other relevant documents that might assist you uh, developing your proposal. So I'll just read you out an example of uh, a national level priority from Palau. It's from the NVSAP, uh, and it says, target the three remaining states without protected area network sites to nominate candidate sites so that all 16 states are represented in the protected area network. And just an example of a site level priority uh, from Gardok Nature Reserve. Uh, the priority is to use the existing tourist and visitor potential of the site to develop a sustainable financing plan. And another priority is to develop a legal framework to address the prosecution of site violations. So there's the NVSAP and the PAMI assessment report. So just one more example. Um, some of the countries, we weren't able to locate any site level priorities, and that, that's okay. Um, so Timor Leste is just an example of that. They've, um, okay, back one. Uh, so for Timor Leste, Friendly reminder, if you wouldn't mind um, keeping your microphones on mute, that would be great. Thank you. Uh, okay, so the, the national level priorities here are from Timor Leste's NVSAP um, and also the action plan for implementing the CBD's program of work on protected areas. 
Uh, so as I said, no site level pro, uh, priorities that we could find. Um, but an example of the national priorities for Timor Leste are to delineate and map protected and locally conserved areas, establish effective management systems, management plans, enhance staff capacity, explore tourism opportunities, these kinds of things. And then you can see down the bottom there is the list of resources. So in the online application form, this is what uh, this section will look like. The left column there is where you indicate which of the three objectives your project aligns with. And then down the bottom of column one there is where it says priorities for action that the project is aiming to address. Please specify here those priorities. So that's where you would say, uh, you kind of quote the priority and include a reference to the document. And then the second column there is just where they're asking you which of those three uh, source options you, you found your priorities from. So was it from the diagnostic tools, so the, the site level management and governance assessment tools, or was it from a strategic document, or was it from a study? Okay, I might pause there. Are there any questions about prior to the priorities for action? Okay, if you have any questions that pop up along the way, feel free to contact me later. Okay, so we'll move on to examples of eligible activities. So these are just examples. Uh, this is not an exhaustive list. Um, and also just because you, you know, align your project to one of these things doesn't necessarily mean it will be awarded funding. This is just to give you an idea of the type of activities that are in scope. Um, page 30 of the operational manual, so the big document, has um, more examples and more detail, uh, but I've just summarised it here for today. So I'll just read through a few. Um, so activities related to expanding the protected area network are in scope. So that would be establishing and extending areas, creating networks and corridors, uh, formalising informal protected areas, uh, strengthening institutional and legal frameworks. Then also a, a big activity category is uh, protected area management and planning. So this is actually conducting those protected area management effectiveness assessments if you wish to at the site level, that's in scope. Um, strengthening and maintaining on-site infrastructure and equipment, training staff, building capacity, improving visitor management, these kinds of, uh, these kinds of activities. Uh, governance, uh, so developing effective governance arrangements that involve local communities are in scope. Law enforcement, so maybe uh, better communicating protected area boundaries um, to stakeholders, building capacity of our protected area practitioners, conducting anti-poaching or anti-trafficking activities, and activities related to threat reduction, so invasive species control, pest management. Activities related to enhancing livelihoods, so supporting local community initiatives that uh, that support sustainable use of our natural resources, um, measures that safeguard local and traditional uh, knowledge linked to sustainably using these resources, uh, climate change related activities, mitigation, resilience, adaptation, Communication and education. So this could be supporting public awareness campaigns, um, such as Young Rangers or citizen science projects, uh, building capacity for stakeholders to, um, I guess, improve their ownership of conservation efforts. And then um, more traditional PA related activities, such as replanting, restoring, regenerating, mapping vegetation and habitat. These are all in scope. Uh, sustainable financing, so perhaps introducing park entry fees, trust funds, ecotourism activities, payments for ecosystem services, um, and then species recovery, recovery actions as well. Okay, ineligible activities include purchasing land, 
uh, the involuntary resettlement of people, essentially uh, activities that affect vulnerable groups uh, or that include using unlawful pesticides uh, and activities that might negatively affect physical cultural resources. All right, we're just about to move on to financials. So any questions about eligible or ineligible activities? Okay, we can come back to it if we need. So uh, a requirement that is, uh, that is specific to the medium grant size uh, is that applicants must provide a minimum of 5% co-financing. So that means that Biopharma will provide up to a maximum of 95% of the total eligible costs of the project. Um, the co-funded costs must comply with the cost eligibility rules, in-kind contributions are not considered eligible, and personnel costs of lead beneficiaries and partners are not considered as in-kind contributions. So just to reiterate, for the smaller grant sizes, um, this co-financing requirement won't, won't exist. Organisations need to show they have sufficient financial and operational capacity to implement the proposal, and this will be uh, determined in the, in the application form. There's a series of questions that relate to this, where we ask for particular documentation to help, um, provide evidence that, that your organisation has the capacity to successfully deliver the project. So for the budget, there are, are two options. Um, applicants can choose to uh, the more traditional actual cost budget um, or the simplified cost option. So the actual cost is, is um, where you report on the real costs, uh, so your real salary costs and your actual expenditure, and you, you need to provide verification for, um, for, for that expenditure, for example, through invoices or receipts. Um, the simplified cost option is rather than paying on the basis of real costs, um, payments are made on the basis of a predefined unit rate. Um, so actual expenditure is not subject to verification. So essentially, based on statistical and historical data, um, you estimate your, the cost of your project, um, that those costs are agreed, and you're, you'll be paid that amount. Whether your implementation costs come in lower or higher um, is, is a matter for you. So the benefit of this, it, it, it simplifies the project, um, but there is a risk that if the costs aren't um, accurately estimated and end up being higher, um, your organisation will bear those, that additional cost. So there's a management fee or an indirect cost um, category of 7%. This is the, the maximum that the European Union allows, and unfortunately that, that can't, that's capped at 7 um, and that 7% is applicable to the budget of the project as a whole. So, for example, if the whole project um, was for 100,000 euros, 7,000 euros could be allocated to the management fee or indirect costs. Uh, and if you're in a partnership arrangement, how you distribute that management fee between organisations is a matter for. Uh, and subgrants are not allowed. So you can't provide financial support to third parties through subgrants. Um, Subcontracting consultants or um, groups for particular services is okay, um, just not, just not subgranting. If you have any questions about um, the budget, we're, we're happy to help, just, just get in touch. It looks like this. So in the application form, you'll come online, you'll come to the budget section where there's a button where you download this Excel spreadsheet and then you uh, fill it out and you re-upload it into the portal. So this spreadsheet has four tabs. The first one here is the, um, the main budget tab. Uh, then there's the justification tab where you explain your costings. The third tab is expected sources of funding and that's where your um, co-contributions co would be entered. And then tab four has um, much more detailed instructions about, about all of these line items. So just briefly, I think this is relatively standard categories of eligible costs. So human resources, uh, travel costs, 
equipment or project supplies, your local office costs and other costs and services are, are eligible. Um, and just a note on that 7% indirect costs, that, that can't be duplicated um, with direct costs. So for example, if your rent or electricity is budgeted, then that percentage of indirect costs um, might be removed down. Okay, I think this is also pretty pretty standard, the ineligible costs, so um, land or building purchases, in-kind contributions, currency exchange losses. Uh, just a note there on the salary costs of government staff. Um, Biopharma obviously can't cut, uh, fund core activities um, that staff would, would, would be doing anyway, um, they, but they can fund activities related specifically to the project that would not have otherwise been done. And you can't make private profit from Biopharma funds. Okay, um, are there any questions about the budget before we move on to environmental and social safeguards? All right, um, so all IUCN projects are screened for negative uh, environmental or social impacts. Uh, IUCN has developed a, a system or a policy framework to help, help with this task. Um, it's based on one by the World Bank. It's very quite closely aligned, I believe. Um, and it guides it guides uh, all kind of IUCN activities, whether they're supporting or implementing projects. Uh, it's underpinned, the ESMS, Environmental and Social Management System, is uh, underpinned uh, by eight principles and four standards. So I've just, uh, they're kind of dotted around in this diagram, but I've just put them here in the list, which is a little easier to read. Uh, the eight overarching principles relate to rights-based approaches, protecting vulnerable groups, gender equity, um, good stakeholder engagement, applying the precautionary principle, these kind of things. Um, and then there are four particular standards or triggers uh, with uh, a lot more detail uh, kind of sitting behind them, there's policies on each of these four standards uh, and proposed actions that we can take if we think uh, there are serious risks of um, harm from CM funded projects. All proposals will be screened for potential negative and environmental social impacts. So that image there is, um, is taken from the operational manual. It's a, a series of questions that are now embedded in the online application form, referred to as the ESMS questionnaire. So applicants will need to answer those questions and that will help um, help us determine uh, if there are any risks and if so, uh, whether they've been adequately mitigated. Um, and we'll be doing that during the assessment phase. So once your project, we'll be doing that, um, that review in the assessment phase. Phase. So once your proposal is submitted, um, it will be reviewed for its ESMS risks and assigned a risk category, um, either low, moderate or high. Um, during this phase, uh, we'll just be looking at whether the, the project risks have been sufficiently identified um, and addressed by the project design, um, or whether there's any further risk assessment or further consultation needed, for example. Uh, so this very colourful document is, is just demonstrating the, the cycle for the medium grants. Uh, up the top there is the call for proposals and then we go through the assessment, selection, um, agreement and implementation and it indicates the, the, the points where the ESMS um, considerations come up. So in the, in the project design phase which you're in now, um, this is where you'll be submitting the ESMS questionnaire. And um, we'd suggest, if it's possible, provide as much detail as you can um, so, that, so that it's clear to us that any risks have been considered and properly uh, managed. For projects uh, in the screening phase, so once, once the projects are under assessment, uh, for those that are assigned a low risk rating, there'll be no further, no further action 
required. Uh, those that are assigned a moderate risk rating uh, might need a bit of tweaking. So at that stage, we might come back to you and ask for some more information about your project design or, the, or more evidence of stakeholder feedback and how that's been incorporated. Uh, and we may require some changes to the project design. Um, in most cases, these should be able to be accommodated within the budget, um, the existing budget. Um, but if but there may be additional costs depending on, on what action is needed. So that process will just be through negotiation um, with us. For projects that are assigned a high risk rating, um, these are unlikely to be funded. Uh, so that would be where, for instance, the project needs uh, a full-blown environmental and social impact assessment to be carried out before it could start. Um, they're very expensive and they take a long time. Um, so it's, it's highly unlikely that projects would, that propose those kind of risks would, would get through. An example of an additional um, measure that we might ask, ask of you would be to develop, for instance, an action plan to mitigate impacts from access restrictions. So this, this would be a document, we would provide a template um, that described expected restrictions or negative impacts and on, on who, uh, detailed the measures that would be put in place to avoid, mitigate or compensate for these impacts and essentially establishes um, the basis for an agreement with the affected parties. Uh, so they're the kind of questions we'll be asking uh, when we're reviewing. Uh, oh, uh, also just to note, Paul and I will be um, uh, will be kind of leading on the ESMS review, but we won't make any decisions about projects. We'll simply be advising um, the decision makers. So this, uh, there was an image of this at the beginning of the presentation. This is the uh, a manual specifically for Biopalma. Uh, you saw earlier we have an IUCN-wide ESMS manual and website, and you're welcome to look at that. There's a lot more detail on that one. But for um, for applicants, uh, just specifically for Biopharma, we strongly recommend you read this document um, before before starting the, your project design, and definitely before completing the application. This is just a list of um, e examples of, of the types of things that we might ask for to, to, for you to demonstrate your organisational and financial capacity. So proof of your legal status, um, your latest activity report, for instance, your, your annual reports or donor reports, financial statements, audit reports, uh, these kinds of things. And there'll be, within the template, there'll be options to upload documents like these. Uh, just a little summary of what you'll need to submit. So for your technical staff, not, not for your support staff, but if your technical staff are known, uh, we'd like to see a, a brief CV just outlining their skills. Uh, the ESMS questionnaire, which we've spoken about, the log frame, which we've spoken about, the budget, uh, and then right at the end is the applicant declaration and submission checklist. The checklist looks like this. It's, it's essentially just... Uh, have you done this? Have you uploaded this? Have you answered this? Uh, and it's just to make sure that we've got all the basic material that we need uh, for an eligible application. Just some other tips for a strong proposal. Um, activities that have co-benefits beyond conservation will be well regarded. Uh, proposals will be assessed for how well stakeholders have been engaged, both in developing your proposal, but also how how they'll be participating in the project over time. Uh, proposals will be checked for how well they complement uh, existing initiatives. So if they're building on projects that have just come to an end or they complement them uh, and, and they don't duplicate effort, uh, that's what we're looking for. And uh, yeah, obviously uh, we're here to help you, Paul and I. So please let us know if your organisation intends to apply and uh, we'd be happy to talk to you about your proposal. Just on the assessment, so uh, I mentioned at the beginning, um, Paul and I won't be assessing proposals. The process, um, once submission closes on the 21st of September, 
the proposals will be handed to uh, an independent regional advisory committee. So each of the Biopharma regions has, is convening its own committee of experts, and these are experts from the Pacific region that will review the proposals and make recommendations uh, and provide a, a score out of 100 and, and recommend which ones they think should be funded. Paul and I will support this committee um, and will be involved in the environmental and social safeguard component of it. Um, then the list of recommendations uh, is submitted to a central validating committee, uh, which is made up of uh, representatives of the donor. So this, this validating committee uh, up in headquarters will further review all the um, recommendations from all the regions and award the proposals. And as I mentioned, you know, along the way, we might ask, we might get back to you and ask for some additional documentation or evidence or information to help us assess your proposal. So um, we're in the 90-day uh, proposal uh, section. Proposals are due on the 21st of September, and then there's about a two-month window for assessment. This is this is our indicative timeline. Um, so we would like to see notification um, for successful applicants in the new year, with with um, contracting occurring in the first first quarter of next year. Just a, a quick overview of the way the proposals will be scored. Uh, so you can see there that out of 155 points are awarded for technical coherence and understanding. So this is the basic eligibility criteria, the activity and location um, requirements, your activities and expected results, your ESMS component, kind of that's the, gut, the guts of the proposal basically. And then there's 20 points for your budget, and proof of organisational capacity, the sustainability of the activities and replication potential, um, complementarity with other projects, and your communication and outreach activities uh, are worth five points. Okay, um, so back to the Action Component Portal website. Um, there's also a, a, a section on here where you can sign up for alerts. So all of you are on our regional mailing list anyway, but um, you're welcome to put your name in that uh, general global list and you'll be sent um, notification of all calls for proposals and other important announcements that way. Paul is the official action component focal point um, for the Pacific. So there are his details there uh, and you all have my email um, and you're welcome to contact either of us anytime. So that is it. Um, if there are any questions, you're welcome to ask them. And and then if, if anyone's interested, I'm happy to just briefly show you what the portal looks like and then, and then we can all go.